Hello guys, so thank you all for coming back. So we have our last one hour session. It's a Latin American panel, uh, very interesting discussions, I hope. So you're going to hear from people from all over the region and, and Alexander Barbosa, which is the uh, president of CETIC um, and linked to um, Nick.br. So he's going to be moderating the panel and he's coming from Sao Paulo, Brazil. So please welcome Alex to join the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here with you to this exciting panel on Latin America uh, use on adoption of AI for development. My name is Alexandre Barbosa, as Omar has said. I'm from uh, the Regional Center for Studies on the Development of Information Society, which happens to be a UNESCO Category 2 Center for Latin America and Portuguese-speaking countries in Africa. And we are linked to the Brazilian Network Information Center. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite our panelists, our bright minds, to be here with me. And I would like to invite uh, Guilherme Canella, who is the <coughs> Communication Information Advisor for Mercosul from the UNESCO office in Montevideo, Uruguay. <laughs> then I would like to invite uh, Mr. Emmanuel Letouzet, Director from Data Pop Alliance. Uh, also, Joana Barom, who is the Directress and Policy Strategist of Coding Rights uh, so, so Civil Society Organization in Brazil. And last but not least, uh, Juan Ortiz Freuler, who is a Senior Policy Fellow at the Web Foundation, located here in Cambridge. Um, so thank you very much for being here with us today. And I would like to start by thanking Omar and how his team for this great uh, work and for giving us the opportunity to explore a little bit more uh, different views on uh, how can AI be used for sustainable development in the region. And I think that we had a very good uh, uh, overview in the previous panel on uh, how is the situation from the government perspective in terms of uh, AI national strategies in those countries that we, we've seen. And now we, we will discuss a little bit more from different perspectives how AI can be really uh, adopted for the sustainable development and how our, uh, governments are being prepared for this adoption and also <clears throat> the challenge and the opportunities that AI offer in the terms of development. We all know that AI debate, all the, this debate around AI is not new. My background itself, I'm an engineer and <laughs> computer scientist, and uh, maybe much older than most of you. And when I was doing my master and then my PhD, we discussed AI from a different perspective. And this debate in this earlier uh, 80s was much more focused around computer science but today, I think that this debate has moved into different dimensions. As we saw this debate on ethics, uh, algorithmic bias, also uh, privacy and personal data protection, uh, sustainable development. So there is a new, whole, uh, new wide area of debates that goes beyond computer science. And of course, that this makes AI uh, not only a multidimensional phenomena, but also a multi-layered, different layers that we have to, to discuss. Not only infrastructure, but also all the ethical implications. And uh, I, I think that uh, this topic is of much great relevance, relevance for governments in Latin America. But it is also important to say that uh, there is no Latin Amer uniform Latin America region itself. We have disparities. So not only in terms of infrastructure, as we have seen in the previous panel, but also in terms of skills, in terms of approach, in terms of public policies. So that's uh, what we would like to discuss a little bit uh, today. And uh, last but not least, 
it is important to mention that there is a, I would say, a growing consensus among not only gov governments, but mainly multilateral multi organizations, international organizations, that AI plays a very important role in sustainable development. And so I would like to start uh, our debate. We have four bright minds in front of you, and uh, not all of them we are, is going to, are going to present using PowerPoints, but we do have uh, very small slides that some of them are going to use. And I would like to start with uh, Guilherme Canella from UNESCO to give us a broad perspective from an international organization. And in the case of UNESCO, I strongly believe that UNESCO plays a very important role in this debate about a human-centered AI. What are the aspects and what are the dimensions that goes beyond algorithmics and infrastructure? And how can this multilateral cooperation uh, on AI be ensured between relevant international agents, such as UNESCO, regional organizations in Latin America, so that we are not reinventing the wheel as it concerns the development of norms and standards of AI governance. We didn't discuss much in the first panel about AI governance. And I think that this is a key topic to be discussed among policymakers, civil society, and the industry, all the AI-based industry. And also, uh, Guilherme, we have been working with the UNESCO very closely in some frameworks, like the ROM frameworks. Maybe you could uh, discuss a little bit what strategies and what frameworks and principles, ethical principles, for instance, or human-based principles that have been recently developed by UNESCO that could be applied to AI development in Latin America, considering these human-centered values. So uh, I will give you eight minutes. I will be very strict with the time. Each speaker will have eight minutes. I will let you know when you have two minutes left and after that, we will open the floor for your questions. So, Guilherme, you have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the organizings, organizers for having me and also Alexander for putting this panel together. As you can see by his questions, it's just impossible to answer these kind of questions in eight minutes, no? So the provocation. Uh, what I'm going to do is try to raise eight points each one minute for each. So let's see if this will be useful to illustrate a little bit how this discussion can be uh, moving forward from the perspective of a multilateral intergovernmental organization. As you know, UN organizations are a club of states. Our main governing bodies are, are the member states of the organization in 193 states with all the opportunities these have because we have the opportunity of interact with uh, governments, ministers, uh, presidents, parliaments, judges all the time, but also with the limitations these have because at the end of the day those are uh, the people with the ultimate decision-making power in our organizations. So in that sense, the first thing I would, the first point is uh, last November, the UNESCO General Conference, which is our maximum body, uh, decided to ask the secretariat, us, the, the, the employees of the organization, that for the next two years, we need to prepare a draft recommendation on standards for artificial intelligence. And in two years' time, those 193 member states will take a decision on this recommendation, which will become international law in terms of artificial intelligence. So gatherings like this are very important to offer inputs to this two-year process that will have uh, a finishing line in November 2021. No, yes, 2021. And, um, and uh, why UNESCO is involved on that? No? So, as many of you know, UNESCO is in charge within the UN system for five areas. Education, and we heard a lot this morning about the importance of artificial intelligence for education. Hard sciences, so engineering or all those things. Social and human sciences, so all the issues related to ethics and philosophy and bioethics is under this area. Culture, so there's lots of implications for culture and artificial intelligence. And finally, the area of freedom of expression and knowledge societies, that area that I'm responsible uh, for Latin America until the end of this month. 
And uh, from February and on, I mean, I'm being moved from my post from Latin America to the same areas, but in Paris. So I will have global functions and not no longer uh, be in charge for this area in Latin America. So this is the first one, why UNESCO? And I think you all can take advantage of this process. It's a huge opportunity that the member states are opening to, for, to drafting a recommendation regarding ethical principles for AI, and it's a two-year process, so we have time to influence this process. Second element is principles. Uh, we don't need to re reinvent the wheel. That document that was approved by all, by all member states in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, is very valid in, until today. So what we need is to think how those 30 and plus articles are applicable to the new challenges of artificial intelligence. But for instance, if you read the Article 19 that is about freedom of expression, uh, freedom of information, you will see that the mothers and fathers of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they haven't flagged any particular technology. If you read the article that they have said, all this is valid through any platforms and without borders. So these people were very avant-garde in 1948, and uh, they already envisioned that technology would change, but human rights don't. So we will need to guess how those rights uh, will be uh, interacting with the challenges of AI. For instance, children, my colleagues from UNICEF are working a lot on how artificial intelligence can impact in children's rights. Gender, we can see in this conference, the problem of gender balance here, there. So how we are going to get more women involved in those discussions? And this is not a problem of this particular conference, it's a problem of UNESCO's conference in this area and others. So we need to think more about this, gender and, and artificial intelligence. This morning, many people talk about the impacts in, worker, in workers' rights. Again, how my, my colleagues in uh, international work organization, labor organization are working on this. So Again, back to the principles of human rights. Under human rights, this is my third point, freedom of expression and privacy are particularly relevant in this discussion of artificial intelligence. Uh, the impacts on, um, on political rights and particularly freedom of expression through things like fake news, deep fake, and etc., are particularly relevant. Uh, electoral authorities all over the globe, and particularly in Latin America, are very much concerned on the impacts of all of this in the electoral processes, but there are others uh, kinds of impacts that can be generated for this kind of technology, and this is not necessarily all bad news. There are good opportunities, there are good impacts, so we need to think about that. And the issue of privacy, of course, is huge. It was discussed already this morning with the example of facial recognition, but it's beyond that. Perhaps privacy would be one of the huge challenges of the next 20 years. And it's not only because of AI. If you look in the history of the Enlightenment period, that is the founding uh, characteristics of our uh, democracies, human rights perspectives in the last 200 years, Privacy is in the very center of this discussion, and it's why our civilization is framed in many ways. So if price, privacy, as the, the Economist magazine has said in 1998, is dead, this will reshape a lot the way we do many things. So we need to think about that, again, under the perspective of human rights for an organization like UNESCO. My fourth point is that we need to think all of all of this in terms of opportunities and risks. So it's not only bad news, although as you saw by the research showed this morning, people are frightened for many reasons. Some of them are good reasons, some of them are just lack of knowledge on what's going on. But we need to really pass the message that the, the, the deal here is to maximize opportunities and mitigate the risks. And not necessarily to say that every time a risk is a bad thing. Some, sometimes you need to take risks to be resilient, to avoid harm. The real problem is harm. So how we deal with harm when it happens. And then it's my fifth point. We need to deal with harm with more ethical principles, and then we can have things like self-regulation, we can have things like how we improve ourselves, our, our own principles as academics, uh, UN organizations, governments, enterprises, our own code of ethics. 
but sometimes we will need regulation. Only ethics won't be enough. And then what are the amount of regulation we want? The amount of regulation is acceptable and that is in line with those human rights and freedom of expression and privacy uh, international standards. So it's not all regulation that is accepted by those same uh, international principles. Two minutes. My sixth point is transparency and accountability. We need to talk a lot more about how those different players uh, that are in charge of this AI field, including big companies, perhaps mainly big companies, how they can be more transparent and more accountable in what they are doing. So we talk a lot about this is necessary, but we are not doing enough in, in producing real uh, strategies for increasing or enhancing the trans this transparency and accountability. Seventh point, we need to look beyond the usual suspects in terms of stakeholders. So it's very important, for instance, to include judges in this discussion. These people will need to take very serious and new and creative decisions in an area that most of them have no clue on how to discuss. So how we are going to involve more of these people, not after everything is already decided, but beforehand when they can also offer their views. Journalists, for instance, Latin America, the coverage of media on these issues is very, very poor. So that's why the population is also so scared, because they don't understand, because the main interlocutor with the society is not prepared to do this discussion. And finally, we will need, it. this is my eighth point and final point, we need to find ways of empower the average citizen in this discussion. Uh, and average citizen, it's uh, the teacher in the basic schools, uh, is the cab driver that is worried about Uber, is the everyone. And this is, it will require a lot of digital literacy on those issues so that people can be, the citizens can be really part of this discussion. And finally, as an, an overall point, uh, we will need, and I think for Latin America, this is an urgent need, we will need to to, to assist governments to have a more serious discussion on policy. Uh, we will need to discuss national plans of artificial intelligence and, and, and now, today, the, the day we are speaking, this is really in very, very early stages, not to say that in no stage in many countries in the region, and, uh, and this is a gap that will need to be soon uh, dealt with. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Guilherme. Uh, for giving this very comprehensive view of UNESCO perspective on how to address human rights on AI implementation. I would like to say that UNESCO is conducting regional uh, forums to debate AI and AI governance. The first one was uh, in Morocco last year, I mean 2018. In 2019 we had uh, three forums, one in China, in Beijing, one in France, in Paris, and the last one was exactly one month ago in Brazil. Uh, it was a Latin American, the Caribbean Forum. And I believe that UNESCO conducting such regional uh, 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 discussion on AI is a, a very important input for policy making. So to engage government in this debate. So thank you very much for that. So now let's move to uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Letousse from Data Pop Alliance who has been working in this AI field and big data, uh, not only in Latin America, but mainly in Brazil, in Chile, in Colombia. So he has a very good perspective on the challenges and risks uh, on the region. And I would like to start, uh, Emmanuel, by asking you, what are the opportunities and challenges that big data and AI can provide for monitoring the sustainable development goals, and also uh, you are very much uh, linked to a very important uh, initiative called Open Algorithms, OPAO. So how can OPAO can be used in this context, and what, are, what is the innovative aspects of this project? Uh, if you can provide some example in Latin America, it would be really good. Thank you. Uh, here we have, a, you have eight minutes, huh? Yes, yes. All right, can I stand? Is it okay? Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, well, good morning. So, first of all, well, yeah, thank you, Omar, and congratulations on the uh, on the event. I know it's very hard to uh, yeah pull pull together. 
Um, so, yeah, so you can see the title is very ambitious. Uh, so I have only seven and a half minutes now. Um, so I have also like some affiliations at, um, um, at MIT. Uh, and so if you want to know more about the work that we do as Datapop in Latin America, you can check the website. I'm not going to go uh, too much in depth, but I will show some examples of concrete projects that we run in, uh, in Latin America. So, okay, so I think the, so I have about 10 slides. So I think the big question today is that, so we're entering this like the second decade of the data revolution or the fourth industrial revolution, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, we can all sense that there is a lot of you know, growing discontent in Latin America, but also like globally, including in my home, home country in France. Uh, so you see some of those, um, yeah, some of you know, the recent events uh, in the region. Uh, so Oxfam just released a, a report about inequality uh, around the world. Can you hear me okay? Like, I, I can see if there's some, yeah, okay. Um, and so, yeah, so the world's like bil billionaires have owned as much as like 4.5, well, almost like, no, sorry, like almost like 7 billion people. Um, and so there, there is really this question about is AI going to help or hurt? Is it going to uh, like increase, foster those kind of inequalities? And is it going to lead uh, perhaps to like, you know, global wars and so on and so forth? Um, and of course, so if you see that like here in the top right corner, there is really the question about the, the role that AI uh, can play in, a, in maybe like fostering like, you know, tyranny. Um, and so the, the Human Development Report, uh, UNDP Human Development Report last year, was focused on inequalities. And I think this question of inequality has become or should become like central when we think about whether and how uh, AI can do anything uh, for societies, good, good or bad. And so, yeah, so uh, as, as Alex said, so the question is often framed as how can AI, big data, help monitor the SDGs, so the sustainable development goals, like fill data gaps. Uh, so, you know, those kinds of arguments. But there's also the question of causality. Uh, is it by monitoring something? How does that translate into affecting the, the, the something? And I think trying to make this connection is uh, this like, causal link or think about how we can strengthen the causal relationship between measuring something, measuring poverty, measuring inequality, measuring climate change, etc., and actually changing what you measure is actually uh, harder than, than it looks. Uh, and so you can see here like, just like two recent, a, a paper from 2015 and a paper from 2019 uh, so that I wrote and we worked with Datapop exactly on the question of big data AI uh, for the measurement and uh, the promotion. So both aspects of uh, human development, including but not only the, the SDGs. The one on the left hand side is online. The second one is still under review and it won't, so it's a background paper to the human development report and it will be online in, uh, I think, March. And so um, to answer uh, Alex's main question, here being at, you know, at MIT and this crowd, I think is quite familiar with machine learning approaches. So in a nutshell, uh, we've discovered for the past 10 years that yes, indeed, it is possible to monitor some development indicators, uh, to measure, to estimate, to proxy them using so machine learning approaches and those kinds of the new data sources, so breadcrumbs, as Sandy Pentland here at MIT calls them. So it's your uh, call detail records. Uh, it can be also like bank transactions. So because there are systematic correlations and patterns between who you are and who we are as groups and how we look in those digital uh, data and dig digital traces. So there's, there's been a long literature now developed on how you can actually use those kinds of big data sources and methods to estimate uh, development uh, indicators, including the SDGs, although we are really in the very early stages of industrializing this, industrializing this. <coughs> and so, but as I hinted, uh, like we know from history that it's not because you measure something that you affect something. So I do cartooning in my pastime. Um, and so this is a, a cartoon that I did at, the, at Eurostat about six months ago. So everybody said, yeah, the data revolution is here. It's amazing. And so you have this, yeah, so like, you know, this white dude saying, it's amazing. You know, we can measure your poverty at very fine-grained levels, et cetera, et cetera. But we can't do anything about it. And why? Because it's deeply political. So one thing that uh, annoys me a little bit is that um, with a lot of people <laughs> around me, including people I respect very much, is that it's like this sort of like this notion that it's going to be, you know, we're, we can tech our way uh, out, out of this mess. 
uh, and that we're going to be able to measure all these things at very fine grain levels, and then governments and leaders meeting in Davos are going to be able to make better decisions. I mean, I think this is, well, I think this is a bit simplistic. Um, and so, basically, yeah, I want to stress this, like, the political nature um, of, of all of that. And so, to go one step, one step further, um, likewise, I mean, we know that AI is really about like machine learning, uh, using data so they get, so they're like self, you know, they, they self-train and they then are able to recognize whether this thing is a beach or a city, they're able to drive. It's not that they're coded, obviously, do go left, go right, it's that they learn over time. And so the big question that I and others are asking ourselves is, can we use the principles of AI, like machine learning, to turn it into like human learning and to be better at learning? So like, you know, what works, what doesn't work? Uh, and so, uh, so, I mean, the slides are online, so I, you know, in just in interest of time, I, I, um, I won't go into like, you know, all the details, um, but it's really, it's really about can we learn from and with machines and with AI? So both as, uh, to use AI both as an instrument, that's easy to understand. It's like you use machine learning to predict poverty. Okay, so you use AI. But it's also, okay. But it's also to be inspired. So this notion of like learning and reinforcing what works and, and doing less of what doesn't work. And I think development is a learning process fundamentally. So on the left hand side, today it looks crazy to us that we drove like that when we were kids. Most of us did. Uh, but today looks crazy to us. And probably data and science had something to do with it to change cultural norms. Uh, and then maybe tomorrow this will look crazy uh, to our kids. Uh, maybe, maybe Davos will look crazy uh, to, our, to our kids. Mm -hmm. So, just to be a bit provocative. Um, and so, we've been, when we thought about, okay, um, what, how can we put in place this sort of, like, a sort of human AI system where we would be inspired by the way artificial intelligence works, but also we would use the principles, uh, the tools of AI to measure uh, the SDGs and uh, be able to like adjust in real time. So there are those four classes, likewise I'm conscious of time, so um, there are th those four classes of considerations, like what, what are the bottlenecks, what are the pillars, what are the considerations, the requirements for building this sort of like human AI <laughs> ecosystem. And, and I will just name them. So there is, of course, the politics, that there are a lot of people who are not interested uh, in, in doing that, especially people in position of power. There are also like scientific and technical considerations uh, and obstacles uh, on the way, how you share those kinds of data uh, at scale, safely, uh, ethically. No one has like cracked that uh, completely. I mean, there are you know, yeah, options, leads, and. I'm, finish on that. And then ethical, legal, of course, it can very quickly become, become Orwellian, uh, elite-centric, etc. And then commercial, like the business case or the business models are really also hard to crack. And so what I've described is sort of like underpins uh, the OPAL project, so the Open Algorithms Project. I'll finish in one minute. Yeah. Um, so the Open Algorithms Project where um, so we do that in, in Colombia and Senegal, and so it's about trying to uh, like create indicators, development indicators from cell phone data, as for the pilot with Telefonica in Colombia, uh, but in ways that is aggregated, anonymized, uh, and that happens behind the firewalls of the company. So it's a question and answer uh, model, and um, I think it's going to be key to the to the future of private data sharing and use that fuels. Uh, this like human AI system and that I think will fuel a lot of initiatives in this space in the next uh, decade. Data literacy was mentioned. Uh, yes, critical. It's not just about uh, uh, like uh, having a small pool of very good data scientists. It has to be a broad-based uh, data literacy and I think data is going to become the, the, the global language on the 21st century. Uh, and then last, so those are some examples of projects we've been running in Latin America. Uh, so as data pub, but also, so it's not a, like a you know, logo dropping. So this is all online. You can, you know, they're all on LinkedIn. I've added like on my LinkedIn, if you want to you know, check, I've added the, the, the slides, you can download them. Uh, and they're all described uh, in detail on, uh, on our website. Um, and so I'll be happy to answer questions now or later uh, over the course of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Manu. I know that Data Pop Alliance is very active in the region. We have been working together for many years, maybe five or six years now. And it's very hard to discuss all these uh, very detailed uh, initiatives in eight minutes. But thank you so much. <laughs> now let's move to a more, uh, another issue of AI. We know that develop AI-based uh, solutions and platform in a responsible uh, manner is indeed a great challenge. Uh, so I would like to hear from you, Joana. How can AI be used in a responsible manner with regards to fairness and non-discrimination? And also, are databases and big data a problem solver or do they reinforce bias? How is is being treated in Latin American countries. Uh, you are an expert in the, those type of issues, algorithmic bias, so I would like to hear a little bit from you on this issue. You have uh, eight minutes as well. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So at Coding Rights, we work particularly uh, trying to expose and redress power imbalances that are built into technologies and its implementations, particularly gender inequalities, but also north and south inequality, if we want to divide the globe as that. Uh, when we think about AI, then those are the main questions that pop into my mind. Uh, to also address issues pertaining to bias and discrimination. So, which li live livelihoods and forms of existence some, some AI projects are promoting and which ones are being excluded? In the morning, uh, facial recognition was mentioned, and I will mention just briefly, we're not going to dive into this deeply, but there is this study from Joy Bolawini here from the MIT on gender and race and discrimination due to facial recognition in which she tested uh, uh, facial recognition softwares from different companies and shows uh, the rate of error, particularly when the faces were black and from uh, female uh, subjects. So like for instance, this one error analysis reveals 90.3, no, 93% of faces misgendered by Microsoft were those of darker subjects. At ACLU, they also tested recognition from Amazon uh, in a database of mugshots of uh, people that got arrested with uh, um, congressmen and they got uh, 28 matches. Uh, most of them of people of color. So for me, so far, facial recognition technology for public security mostly is a failed tech solutionist, solutionist response to a bigger and more complex problem. And it's also discriminating people. Because of uh, usages like that, we have been debating all those uh, ethical principles for AI. This is a map that uh, the colleagues for the, from the Berkman Klein Center did. I'm also affiliated at Berkman. This is the map of ethical and rights-based approaches to principles for AI. UNESCO will be around there as well, so you have to review all that. But she uh, and the group already summarized that the growing consensus around those principles were around eight key thematic trends, privacy, accountability, safety and security, transparency and explainability, fairness and no discrimination, human control of technology, professional responsibility and promotion of human values. That's a lot for us to think and but I, I want to go deeper in some parts of it, which is connected to my mandate to think about power relations and technologies. Uh, just yesterday, Bruce Schneider published this article also on facial recognition, saying that perhaps we are, we are losing the point if we just talk about banning this particular technology. And he calls for a serious conversation about all the technologies of identification, correlation and discrimination. And uh, to, 
to address all those three main processes that are involved in two AI projects, he points out as a, as a problem that we are being identified without our knowledge or consent, our data is being combined uh, with other data, bought and sold without our knowledge and consent, and then uh, companies or states might discriminate us because of all that. So he poses a lot of weight in consent. And at Coding Rights, we have been developing this framework to analyze consent, uh, not the part really on, only from the debate of, of consent on data protection legislation, but the debate of content from feminist theories. We have been debating that for ages uh, regarding consent to our bodies. So we did a list of qualifiers of consent in the data protection debates and consent uh, in feminist theories. And if you see, the list of qualifiers is way longer from the feminist theories. I'm not going to read all of them because of time. But and while in the data protection debates, the list fell short, but not only that, all this is given by an agree button. That, when we think about our relation with um, platforms, but uh, it's even worse if we think about an AI project that's developed by the government, that that agree bottom might not even exist. So what happens today is that we are deprived of no, uh, either when we are interacted, interacting with those platforms, because if we say no, to an oversimplified binary option be between agree and disagree, we will be digitally excluded. The same will happen with public services. If I say no in Brazil to, to give my fingerprint for the election authority, eventually I will I'll be excluded from voting with all the consequences for that. So we need to think and uh, reaffirm the design around AI systems is deeply political. Uh, and I'm holding this book in which we try to uh, talk about AI. And in one article, my, my colleague Paspain and I, we, we did this article, The Colonizing AI, a Feminist Critique Towards Data and Social Justice, in which we analyzed this particular case of AI predicting teenage pregnancy. That was a case that we mapped. We are doing this map, it's work in progress. We are mapping several AI projects by the public sector in Latin America. We saw that the trends were ideas of uh, projects regarding judicial system, education, predictive policing, public health. And we highlighted that one uh, from Argentina. It started in Argentina, in Salta. Uh, with that idea of uh, avoiding major <laughs> pregnancy. Um, you have one minute. John. Okay, I'm going to just pass by this uh, example. And it's. So the, the governor of Salta framed that project like this. With technology based on name, surname, and address, you can predict five or six years ahead um, which go future teen teenager is 86% predestinated to have a teenager pregnancy. That uh, project is an example of a horrible database with a terrible idea being implemented, perhaps, eventually, with a good, uh, ideally, a cause, no? So the database was biased due to inevitable sensitivities of reporting unwanted pregnancies and inadequate to make provisions. Some called that the system posed risk for poor women and children sensitive data because they are predicting, so they're using data uh, with, uh, from children. And, and it also, was an excuse for abandoning policies on sexual and reproductive rights. It was in the middle of uh, the consultations in Argentina for uh, abortion laws, legalizing abortion. Uh, so 
And furthermore, the database only uses data on females. The specific focus on a particular sex reinforces patriarchal gender roles, ultimately, ultimately uh, blame teenager females for unwanted pregnancies, as if a child could be conceived just with a woman. Uh, so this is an example of a model in which opinions are embedded in math. And so we see that big data eventually was not a problem solver, is a tool for discrimination. So we need to think, who are we excluding when we universalize an idea into a model? And just to wrap it, uh, at Coding Rights, we, we like to think about gender surveillance like bringing a gender lenses to surveillance practices so we understand that uh, the motives for surveillance go beyond when you add a gender lenses. It, it gets connected to health, to morality, to other kinds of controls to our body, which ultimately are meant to uh, maintain what the scholar Patricia Hill, Hill, Hill Collins uh, called the ma matrix of domination, which is capitalism, heteropatriarchy, colonialism, white supremacy. So uh, what, what is this world that we are creating if our AI systems are uh, just copying those matrix of domination? Um, I'll wrap it here. So. Thank you so much, Joana, for this, highlighting these so important issues when we are discussing policy and AI governance. Really important. I would stay here for hours talking to you about that. Uh, but uh, now let's uh, move to our final speaker, uh, Mr. Juan Ortiz Freuler. Uh, Juan, what are the challenges for using AI in terms of privacy and consent in the context of Latin America? And also, how can responsible AI be encouraged by design? And maybe if you can also address if there is any best practice or good practice that could be followed, some example. You have eight minutes, and we leave uh, some time for questions from the floor. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you for having me. So I think we're here because we agree that the people in Latin America need better living conditions, need to suffer less from instability, need to be able to flourish and achieve their individual goals, and need to feel empowered to shape their collective futures. And computer processors can help us get closer to those goals, but can also slide us backwards. So we need to take this conversation very seriously, particularly in Latin America, which is the most unequal region in the world, where a small shift in policy can have seismic consequences. Two years ago at the Web Foundation, we acknowledged that AI was becoming uh, a big issue. There was a lot of hype, but also a lot of opportunity. We saw the risk of governments adopting systems that could be overly expensive, inefficient, harmful, or useless. But we also saw lots of opportunities for, for the region to achieve its policy objectives. So we set out to explore what the space looked like and produced four case studies uh, focused in Argentina and Uruguay. And there are three big areas which we believe we should be focusing on when we discuss artificial intelligence. The first is, as a society, what does the path forward look like? As much as, much as many of us in this room criticize algorithmic curation from social media platforms and how they're being used to increase engagement and fuel addiction, is there a place for algorithms to nurture democratic debate? Could it help us ensure that women aren't silenced through hatred, that minorities are actually heard and participating in public debate. Technology is enabling a huge process of transformation, but we shouldn't see this as inevitable, but ensure that it is shaped by the people so that we ensure that it is for the people. We need to ensure democratic processes will be what drive our collective future. And so the second point, is once a policy program is decided, 
through this democratic process, algorithms and machine learning techniques can definitely ensure that it is implemented in a, in a way that is scalable and efficient. And the third one is that we can rely on these systems to assess the distributional impacts of the changes that are being implemented, as our colleagues were, were talking about before. Given that we're at MIT, I'm expecting that you're going to get a lot of focus on point number two about how these systems are executing and producing outputs. And I invite you to think and keep in mind points one and three. So most of the public debate around automated systems is focused on the different models and their ability to perform a complex task at an unprecedented scale and, fo and speed. Yet at the Web Foundation, we've come to the conclusion that success and failure in the deployment of these systems and tools most often depends on coordination across different sectors that are often considered not part of the deployment of a system of AI. Yet the success is not determined by the effectiveness of the machine learning model itself, but whether the outcome is considered legitimate. So we need to consider a broader range of stakeholders and actors a system that might perform well in one setting can lead to a lot of harm in another. And a system with huge design flaws might see these problems neutralized if it's, if it's embedded with good administrative processes. So therefore, there are four key areas. There is the data collection, who decides what data, what data is collected, which is a political process. Who decides what tags are assigned to these categories? Is it possible to assess the quality? Is it fit for the specific purposes that is being used downstream? At a basic level, AI systems have characteristics of a garbage in, garbage out system. If the data the system relies on is faulty, the coders will have a very difficult time in adjusting it. So we need cross coordination between these, those who collect the data and those who leverage it to ensure good outcomes. Second is the model setup. Who defines the rules? Who is able to assess them for bias? Is the system a black box? Is there a mechanism for quality control, public accountability? And the third is one that I think is rarely discussed, which is around the execution. Who is expected to act on the outputs? What are the administrative rules that surround the implementation of the system? Does the public servant have to execute based on the output, or, or is this merely a system that they interpret and then have a conversation around. And fourth, the social legal frameworks that define the broader context in which we're inserting these systems. What does a false positive look like in practice? Do the affected populations have a safety net if they're being excluded from a public service by an AI system, for example? We need actors in charge of each of these four phases to be in close communication. We need to have certification mechanisms showing that they have complied with certain quality checks and flagging certain decisions that they have taken that might change the risk profiles of the decisions that have to be taken downstream by others. This will allow for better decision making and a clearer public accountability process. So we applied this framework to a set of case studies in, in Latin America um, and created a set of flashcards to showcase the elements we believe need to be disclosed to ensure a meaningful public debate around these technologies. Well, you have two minutes. We recommend that the governments establish open source as a rule for the deployment in critical sectors. And we recommended that the metadata, such as this, be disclosed in all cases through a common and regional platform to ensure information sharing across governments in the region to have a conversation about what works and how. And we also included a very specific set of recommendations for public servants who have a position of responsibility on each of those four key steps pertaining transparency, public engagement, and accountability. You can find these on my Twitter handle, JuanOF9. But if I had one point I would like this audience to reflect upon is how do we ensure that technological development is kept under democratic control? How do we ensure that people have a say on what our collective future will look like? If governments are incapable of driving these conversations in a moment of radical technological shift, then government itself will be rendered obsolete. If we believe in democracy, it is our duty 
to ensure that these conversations take place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan. I think that <laughs> you highlighted uh, very important messages, including the necessity of in, uh, engaging multiple actors in this debate. And uh, in this regard, I think that Web Foundation has been making really substantial contribution with these case studies, as those that you have mentioned. Uh, and I would uh, also mention that in Brazil, the Brazilian government is very much uh, engaged in this idea of multi-stakeholder approach to discuss uh, public policies, like uh, our Secretary of Telecommunication has mentioned in previous panel, how the digital transformation uh, policy was fully constructed based on multi open and multi-stakeholder um, discussion involving not only the government, but also the private sector, academia, and civil society organizations. Now the same is uh, on open consultation right now, the AI national uh, policy in Brazil, the IoT plan, so, uh, and also the Internet Bill of Rights that we call in Portuguese Marco Civil da Internet, was fully built upon public consultation and multi-stakeholder engagement. And I think that this is the way that we should uh, move in terms of AI governance. Now we have uh, 10 minutes that I would like to open the fo floor for uh, questions. So if you could please identify yourself and uh, say to whom you are addressing your question. The floor is open. Congratulations, great talks. Uh, I'm Enrique Diaz Canton from Argentina. And Mr. Canela, I was thinking if uh, at UNESCO, are you thinking an, in an, like a kind of AI police, uh, working mainly on prevention of uh, AI deviations that put uh, human lives as ri at risk? You want to collect more? Or? No, you can reply. And how it will be enforced, this uh, recommendation on AI and ethics that the member states of UNESCO are going to approve and discuss in the next general conference in November 21 uh, is still to be decided. No? Obviously, it's very difficult to, to imagine that a UN organization will create a, a sort of a police but uh, what we do in, in, in several areas, for instance, regarding uh, other elements of implementation of human rights related challenges, uh, discussions like the universal periodical review. Uh, this is a still, a, a t this is already a tool at the hands of civil society to debate eventual deviations of member states in terms of apl uh, application of human rights principles. So I think that all the suggestions you might have in the way that this recommendation might be built by UNESCO and approved by member states uh, in, in the next general conference are welcomed. So. Uh, to, I, but if you ask my personal opinion, I don't think we, are, we will reach an enforcement process such as that. But we do need to think in tools of accountability and transparency uh, that might come together with a recommendation like that. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I also have a question for Guilherme Canella. UNESCO has uh, recently approved the ROM framework, meaning it's a framework that can be used as a tool for countries to measure the level of maturity or the level of development of internet in a given country based on these four pillars, rights-based, openness, accessibility, and multi-stakeholder approach. If you could uh, maybe explore how this uh, framework that was thought to be used to measure internet development could be translated or uh, shift into AI assessment. Sure, I mean, uh, as uh, what he said, it's, it's another kind of tool that was again approved by all the member states, so it's not only the work of the Secretariat, it's something endorsed by all the countries that are here. Um, and, uh, and as he said, is looking into the internet environment uh, based on four pillars, rights, openness, accessibility, and multi-stakeholder engagement. 
for assessing if this, the countries, the member states, are actually implementing internet policy under those four pillars, UNESCO has developed another tool called the Internet Universality Indicators. So the indicators to measure those four pillars, which were also endorsed uh, by member states recently. And uh, now, uh, many member states are using this tool. In Latin America, Brazil has already applied. Ecuador and Paraguay are about to publish. To Uruguay as well. Panama is starting their work in, in, in applying that. What we are discovering is some people are already trying to adapt those indicators that were thought for a broader view of internet to specific AI uh, challenges and policies. So it's doable, it's possible, and some member states or other players are doing that by themselves, but UNESCO has already developed some tools in thinking how this could be adapted mm. to broader AI questions that are not necessarily related to the, the usual internet discussions. Thank you. We have one more question here. Hi, my name is Ruth Mondragon. Um, the, in representation of the municipality of San Andres Cholula in Mexico, Puebla. And there is a, like a question open to the panel that, for example, if we have uh, an application in, in an exact field as water resource supply, for example, how we can, if it is so related with big data and privacy, how we can make or start to make tests about a, the application of artificial intelligence in the governments and or where when is the step when we can start to make the policies and the established criteria in order to make these considerations or impl implementations in government who would like to address manu maybe can we start so just to make sure i understand well the question so the, the question is is both how you transfer between fields and then how you, and from that, how you generalize in, in, yeah? Yeah, like how we can use the public data for making tests if we don't have the access, already the access or the criteria of privacy in the data use. Okay, so, okay. So, um, yeah, so there are different levels and layers, um, but yeah, to be as simple as possible. Um, yeah, so everybody's been testing in, the, in this space for, as I said, for about like 10 years. So it's a lot of, yeah, testing and piloting, et cetera. And there is, a, I think, a willingness of different stakeholders to actually get to scale, to scale and systematize those approaches. But we're still having a really hard time addressing this question of access to, to, to so-called private data. So personal data, so the, the data that are collected and control, controlled by private companies. So there have been different models for doing that, and, but there isn't one single model that has come, up, come out as being sort of like the safe model. Uh, OPAL, I think, is, is a good model, but there are also uh, other models. Uh, and I think which model you use depends on uh, the legislation, the specific problem, the context, etc. There are cases where you can do a data challenge, for instance, or you can do like a small pilot under non-disclosure agreement. Um, so it's not really scalable. It's not very systematic. Uh, sometimes it's, some people say, well, it's not very safe. Um, but you can still take like safeguards. And I think the, the end goal is to have enough of those little pieces of evidence and to build connection these, in these local ecosystems. I'm sorry, I think we didn't, haven't really talked enough about actually Latin America. It's like what's happening in Latin America, but there is a vibrant ecosystem of, and like regional uh, initiatives and, 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 and stakeholders across uh, country and a lot of governments that are working on data strategies. But so I think the end goal is to change the, the culture within the, those governments to create connection. So it's a very simple but hard. Uh, political economy question, and but, so you need those kinds of those pilots, those evidence to actually put sort of like things things in motion. But I think we're quite far from having uh, the, the the public health policy of Mexico or Colombia or Ecuador, or whatever, like you know, really based on AI. But this at least this principle that I try to explain of human AI, so that. <laughs> Even in governments, policies be made more on the basis of evidence. Uh, than um, has been the case would be a, like a really good like first step. So it's not AI; it's just like evidence-based policy making. Uh, but eventually, 
I think like governments, we rely more on um, AI systems, but to do that safely, we need a lot of additional like testing and, and safe, safeguarding and regulations. Thank you. Thank you. No, I see no more requests for questions. Yes, last very quickly. We have uh, two minutes. Thank you. Uh, uh, my, my name is Gray Cox. I uh, work in philosophy at College Atlantic in Maine and also worked a lot in uh, Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico with a program we have there. And one of the things that's really, really striking to me is the ways in which uh, in working with, com uh, with communities in Mexico, community is really central. And in thinking about issues like privacy, human rights, um, and some of the other issues that you raise, my sense is that in much of Latin America, especially indigenous communities, uh, have the, the community, the family and the, the larger pueblito, as a, uh, or ajido, as a unit um, in thinking about these issues. And so for privacy, for example, if you go into a small indigenous community, there's a sense in which there's no privacy. Everybody knows everybody and everybody knows everything. But if you're an outsider coming in, they don't want you to know everything. So there's a, a unit of analysis for these kinds of issues about the control of data and so on that's different than if you go into Cambridge, Massachusetts, where it's really the individual and the individual's rights that are at stake, or at most the family. So I'm just wondering to what extent in the projects you're working with and the ways you're thinking about these things, uh, a distinctively Latin American approach that honors um, the, the special concerns of indigenous communities and marginalized communities, where the community is, is a central unit, is, is entering into the thinking. I hope that question makes sense. Thank you. It's a very important issue about community. And privacy uh, <coughs> was a socially constructed concept that becomes from the urbanization. Because as our professor said, in small communities, privacy does not exist. But from someone from outside, maybe they don't want to share their values. We have one very last uh, comment. Maybe we don't have time to reply all of them. Can I just say one word? Like yes, please. Words on that? I think, and maybe we should discuss. But I, I think I would just say like two, two concepts in, in quick, quick, quick answer. One is the question of group privacy, which is becoming increasingly like important. We haven't really figured out like how to assess and how to protect it. But yeah, trying to move uh, or expand the notion of privacy from individual privacy to group privacy. Mm -hmm. And the second, I think, is privacy as agency. So it's not just privacy as like what you want to reveal about yourself. But as you do that, um, it's really about like agency that you decide um, as a group or as an individual um, what you want to reveal uh, to the non-group. To is pretty much connected to what I was saying, that if you are deprived of no, you don't have agency to consent and to rule your privacy. Okay. Last uh, comment or yes. question? Thank you. Rodriguez, I come in from the Environmental Research Center for IPN, the uh, National Political Institute for Mexico. This is for Alex. Uh, let me see. Uh, what is your point of view about the... Um, Socialize, socialize it, the information, for example, not only economy of the environment, for example, for the quality and quantity water, for the quality of the air, for example, and how we can socialize it of this information can be change the perception of the people. Now in Mexico, especially, and I don't know if in America Latina, but probably yes, it's Polarized. The, the 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 population now is in polar. It's uh, it's very very difficult to change the 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 reasons. We lose the significance of the words. The the, the, the president says something and, and probably is 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 not true. <laughs> but this is this is a. I think the 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 way is the perception. If we can change the perception and if the information for the economy, for the environment, can be changed, this, this, perce this perception. Thank you. Any comments? So, just Very, I think part of that has to do with how we manage uh, public discourse. 
especially your last point about polarization. I think there is a, a big opportunity now to think about how do we scale conversations, right? When democratic systems were put in place back in, in Greece, it was very small polis, right? And everyone knew the, the, the relevant actors, the representatives, decision-making processes were public. And then the state started scaling in size and the ability of each individual to actually have an impact on those decision-making processes has been uh, narrowed down. So how can we leverage some of these technologies to strengthen public uh, discourse, to strengthen public debate, deliberative democracy? Uh, all our systems in place, uh, the way we are managing public debate is within private platforms that are designed to increase engagement. They're not designed with public interest uh, objectives in place. And so now at the Web Foundation, we've launched the Contract for the Web, which is an initiative with governments, private sector, and, and citizens to kind of try to tackle these challenges, where we need to make sure that these systems are designed to forward humanity, to make sure that as a collective, as a, as a, as a planet, we we get over the political, social, and environmental challenges that we're facing that require us to stick together as, as a group. And I think public discourse and how algorithms can, can help us break these silos is, is a huge issue and one that we're gonna hear more and more of. Yes, it is huge indeed. Well, uh, we don't have more time. I just would like to maybe try to summarize uh, some of the key messages uh, on this uh, panel, I think that uh, it is very clear that AI governance aspect that was highlighted by many of you related to ethics, privacy, uh, human rights, and human values requires a multi-stakeholder approach. We have to engage mult multiple actors in order to find the best and most adequate model for a given country, for a given reality, as I mentioned in the beginning. Latin America as a whole uh, unity does not exist. Uh, there are huge inequalities between countries and within countries, countries like Brazil, Mexico, uh, huge countries, huge problems. Uh, also, another key message that I think that was highlighted about the e AI ecosystems. We have to better understand the role of each uh, actor in these ec ecosystems. Policymakers, government, AI industry, academia. We discussed uh, today in this morning the importance of uh, AI skilled and job uh, challenges. And also the message that was given by Emmanuel in terms of measurement. Measurement is critical is essential, but is not sufficient. The, all these political uh, actions that has to be put in place based on measurement, but measuring things will not change the reality. So I think that uh, for me, those uh, were the key messages uh, that we can bring to this debate on AI governance and the opportunities and challenges that Latin America uh, is already facing in terms of AI adoption. So I would like to ask you to join me to thank all the panelists.